The Electoral um, Act 2002, um, the amendment that's before the House right now, has a range of amendments, um, including the funding and disclosure laws. So today I'll focus on just the um, part three, four and five of that bill, which is to do with funding and disclosure. Um, amendments may still be made to the bill I'm going to talk about, so I'm talking about it as it is before the House, um, and I can't speak to where it might go um, by the end of today or tomorrow. Okay, so I'm really going to focus on some key terms, who the funding and disclosure laws apply to, some timing of when the obligations come into effect, of what those obligations are, and how the Victorian Electoral Commission will administer those obligations. First of all, I thought I'd just mention some key definitions that are in the bill. Um, political expenditure is the first one. Um, there's a lot of words on that slide, but um, I thought that was important to put those words up here. Um, so political expenditure is expenditure for the dominant purpose of helping um, to promote or oppose a candidate at an election. And a political donation is a gift to a registered political party, a candidate, a group of candidates, an elected member or a nominated entity. Um, or it's a gift to an associated entity or a third party campaigner that's being, it's intended for use as a political donation um, or to incur political expenditure. So therefore for the dominant purpose of directing, um, promoting, helping to promote or oppose um, a candidate <laughs> at an election. Um, and a gift, any disposi disposition of property, so basically any property given um, without valuable consideration is essentially um, the definition. Um, it can include money, services, including paid labour, loans, guarantees, property, <coughs> including a loan of assets, but it doesn't include um, gifts made in a private capacity for personal use annual subscriptions, annual affiliation fees, annual levies, gifts between a registered political party and its nominated entity, volunteer labour, labour shared between branches of the political party, or property used by a shared labour resource um, between branches, so for example a mobile phone that a, a um, volunteer might bring with them from another branch is not considered a gift. So who does the legislation apply to? Well, any person or entity that gives or receives political donations um, is subject to this legislation. Um, so that includes registered political parties, candidates, groups of candidates. Um, interestingly, candidates, um, is it, it, they can just be publicly uh, have announced their intention to run. So it doesn't need to be a formal um, application to the Victorian Electoral Commission in order to qualify as a candidate just for the purposes of these provisions. Um, associated entities, um, which are entities controlled by one or more registered <coughs> political party and they operate wholly or to a significant extent for the benefit of those parties. Um, could be a financial member of a registered political party um, an entity on whose behalf another person is a financial member of a uh, registered political party or an entity that has voting rights in that party. Um, the second reading speech um, cites unions and fundraising clubs as examples of associated entities. Um, third party campaigners are um, subject to these laws. So that's any person other than the others I've mentioned that incurs political expenditure over $2,000 in any financial year. And the second reading speech notes that a uh, third party campaigner um, could include, for example, a, a range of large or small activist or public interest groups, um, provided that, that expenditure is used for political donations, um, sorry, political expenditure, which if you remember the meaning is the dominant person, uh, purpose of helping to promote or oppose a candidate or a party at an election. That's quite specific use of that money, then, then you're a third party campaigner. Um, it applies to nominated entities which have been created solely for the purpose of uh, benefit of the party um, and um, money passing between the nominated entity and the party is not considered a donation because it, it is part of the party essentially. Um, so 
I envision it like a trust of that party that's set up solely for that party. Um, okay, so when will it come into effect? There are three stages of the rules um, that I'm going to talk about that will come into effect. So upon royal assent of the bill, some provisions will come in, and I'll talk about those. Then from 1 July, some apply, and then from 25 November, so that's the day after the next Victorian state election, the rest will come into effect. So from royal assent, there'll be a um, ban on foreign donations. Um, so a donor will need to be an Australian citizen or resident or uh, a business with a relevant um, Australian business number. Um, there'll be a ban on anonymous donations over $1,000, um, so the donor will need to be identified, although not notified till the 25 November um, uh, period, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then um, nominated entities, registered political parties can nominate a nominated entity um, from royal assent, and that will be formally added to the register of nominated entities that the Victorian Electoral Commission will maintain. From 1st of July, um, recipients have to set up a what's called a state campaign account. Um, so the explanatory memorandum to the bill states the purpose of a state campaign account is to separate political donations from the funds used for administration operations, federal elections or other activities, um, particularly the non-political campaigns of third party campaigners. So it's really quarantining out that um, activity that's, that falls under this bill. Um, all political donations received must go into this state campaign account um, and all political expenditure must come out of that state campaign account. Um, for eligible candidates, I'll talk about public funding in a minute, but public funding must go into that state campaign account as well. Um, and the account must be with an authorised deposit taking institution like a bank or a credit union. Um, also from 1 July, um, uh, people, certain recipients can appoint an agent um, to manage their obligations on their behalf. So for a registered political party, the registered officer of that party, which already, that role already exists, they will be the agent for the party. Um, but the other um, actors that fall under this legislation can nominate their own agent, oh, sorry, except for nominated entities, that's also the registered officer of the party. Um, but everyone else, there will be a deemed agent. So for an independent candidate, that will be themselves. Um, for associated entities and third party campaigners, it'll be the financial controller of that um, entity. But if that deemed agent, for whatever reason, um, sees it more appropriate for somebody else to be appointed as an agent, they can do that. Um, from 1 July um, and to be uh, eligible to be an agent the person must be at least 18 years of age and they can't have any convictions against the Commonwealth funding and disclosure provisions they also have to um, consent in a signed written form to be the agent um, the other thing is there'll be new funding for parties um, uh, administrative expenditure funding and the explanatory memorandum states this recognises the administrative burden on political parties um, and independent members. Then from 25 November, the day after the next Victorian state election, the rest of the provisions come on board, so it um, will come into effect. So there'll be a $4,000 cap on donations in any um, election period, which is a four year cycle in Victoria. Um, and um, a registered political party, its endorsed candidates, groups, elected members, and its nominated entities will be considered one um, recipient for the purposes of donations. Um, and members of a group of legislative council candidates are also considered one recipient. So donations to one counts towards the overall cap. Um, there will be a limit on the number of third party campaigners that people can donate to, so they'll only be able to donate to six. Um, there will be obligations to disclose those donations um, <coughs> online that are um, 
more than $1,000 within 21 days of the donation having been made or received. Um, recipients will be required to submit annual returns in relation to their political expenditure um, to the Victorian Electoral Commission at the end of the financial year, um, in fact 16 weeks after the end of the financial year is the deadline, um, and it will need to set out detail for a registered political party will be the total amount um, of money they'd received, the total payments, total debts incurred, um, and then specific details for all amounts received, um, outstanding debts and um, that are over the disclosure threshold. And those amounts, um, that income is not only political donation, but all income. Then associated entities and third card party campaigners only need to provide uh, their annual return as only the details of their state campaign account. Um, and the explanatory memorandum recognise, or states that um, associated entities, third party campaigners and nominated entities should only be required to report on their political expenditure and not other activities that are unrelated to Victorian state elections. Um, they, the associated entities and third party campaigners also have to provide um, financial reports they may prepare for other purposes such as um, give a report given to ASIC um, and the EM states that's um, acknowledging the close relationship that associated entities and nominated entities ha and have with political parties and that assists the Commission in monitoring compliance with the legislation. Um, and then public funding is the other one um, that comes into effect on 25 November. Um, which will be new advance payments for eligible candidates. So in administering the legislation, the v Victorian Electoral Commission must publish those donations that are disclosed to it of $1,000 or more. It must maintain a register of uh, nominated entities. It must also, and, and sorry, and publish them. It must also publish the annual returns that it receives as, as they've been received. Uh, and it must uh, maintain a register of agents, although it's not required to publish that register. And just a note there, um, it will not publish confidential information, and confidential information has a specific meaning in this legislation, um, that is the street address of a donor, um, not their suburb or state, just their street address, and the address of a silent elector is also confidential. So. Uh, even though annual returns may itemise all the donors and their addresses, we would not be publishing that information, but we would publish everything else as it's provided. I just wanted to talk through the donation process um, as we understand it. So, and this is a very sort of basic version um, of what we think the process will be. So essentially, the donor provides money to the recipient. The recipient considers whether that money's been provided, uh, the donation has been provided within the rules. If the answer's no, well, the money should be returned um, and not accepted. If the answer's yes, then they must notify the Victorian Electoral Commission <coughs> through its online disclosure um, uh, system. And the donor must notify as well if the donation's been accepted. So they're both notifying. Then there's a reconciliation process that happens. So hopefully they're both notifying the same amount and the same details and it reconciles. Um, but uh, there will be um, a process of clarifying if the spelling of the name's wrong or the amounts differ slightly or there's a discrepancy or one party's disclosed but the other one hasn't yet. So there'll be a, an effort to try and reconcile those. And then the donations public published um, for the public to um, to view, and that process occurs in Queensland at the moment. Um, so it'll be relatively similar to their process, I expect. Um, the timeline there I've got down the bottom. So they have 21 days to disclose from receipt or donating, and then the VEC has seven days to publish from that notification. So if we were unable to, or the reconciliation pro process hadn't occurred by the time our seven days are up, then we'd have to just publish as is and still seek to um, encourage the parties to reconcile. So 
So um, I've mentioned funding already, um, but the two um, sources of funding, the admin expenditure funding is a new payment paid in advance. It's uh, $10,000 per elected member per quarter, and that commences from 1 July as the bill stands today. Um, so the, the parties will be expecting their first payment shortly, um, and it will be paid quarterly thereafter. And then public funding um, will be paid in advance. So currently, there is public funding currently, um, but it's paid in arrears at the end, uh, uh, after the result of the election is known based on how many first preference votes were given in each house, I'm uh, sorry, achieved in each house. Um, and I believe the rates currently are about $3 for upper house and $1.75 or so for lower house. So it's increasing to those amounts. Um, and so for the 2018 election, you'll have people submitting claims for the election just passed and people submitting claims for their projection um, for the 2022 election. So payments in advance will be based on the immediately preceding election, the results of the immediately preceding election. So the explanatory memorandum um, states that the purpose of Division 4A, which is sets out the powers of the Commission, is to provide the Commission with powers required to monitor, enforce and enforce the political donations and disclosure regime. Um, so the Commission is being given powers to issue notice if it needs further evidence or documents of any kind to monitor compliance. It's been um, provided with powers to recover money either money that was donated improperly, um, you know, over the cap or against the rules in some way, or money that was given in funding that was, um, uh, needs to be recovered because it, uh, it, it shouldn't have been given um, uh, in the event of um, somebody leaves parliament in the middle of a term, all that kind of a thing. Um, it, it's been given powers to prosecute wrongdoing um, and uh, it also um, audits donation disclosures and annual returns um, to ensure their compliance. Penalties range from uh, around 200 penalty units, which uh, I looked it up, it's approximately $30,000, um, to 10 years jail for circumventing um, a prohibition or requirement under part five of the bill. Um, and the explanatory memorandum states these penalties are used as a deterrent and to emphasise the importance within, um, of compliance within the scheme. So I also just wanted to talk a little bit about the Victorian Electoral Commission's um, approach um, at the outset to these powers. So although we have powers to prosecute, it would obviously um, in the first couple of years, people are trying to get used to their obligations and um, needing to be educated and learn um, how, how um, to comply and what they need to do with this online system, etc. So we'd be taking a constructive compliance approach, which is based on a work cover model, which is really seeking to encourage um, compliance by telling them the rules, giving guidelines, um, having fulsome information on our website, um, targeting stakeholder engagement and then being there to provide advice and information and support, uh, engage, communicate, foster consolidated trusting relationships with stakeholders so that they're calling us when they don't understand as opposed to seeing us as a regulator that's going to come down on them the first time they make a mistake inadvertently. Um, and, uh, you know, running education and training um, and then internal review of decisions if um, they're questioned. And then we have those deterrence powers, obviously in the face of egregious wrongdoing, that's very clear. Um, we would certainly be ready to use them. Um, so uh, we just seek to try and help people comply in the first instance, particularly in the first few years. Um, the timeline, I've outlined this already, but um, this helps to see it on a visual. It was introduced into Parliament on the 8th of May. Uh, legislation we hope will pass late June uh, and then those provisions coming into effect 1st of July with the rest coming in um, 25 November 
And then the next sort of significant date is when the annual returns will be due 16 weeks after the end of the next financial year. And then that will just sort of roll on annual returns process. Um, so, really that's about um, all I wanted to say. We'll await um, the outcome of the legislation as it's passed to see if any further amendments are made um, other than what I've outlined today. And we uh, want to reiterate, we stand ready to administer the funding and disclosure scheme in accordance with our obligations. Thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, turning up and I think uh, thank you for Susie for making time and it was excellent presentation actually really sets up the scene uh, very nicely in terms of um, uh, my presentation which is really uh, centered upon two questions you have on the slide. Uh, one is really testing the claim that the government has made that the bill that uh, or the changes the political finance changes in the bill that is tabled before parliament provides for in the previous words the strictest and the most transparent protocol donation laws in Australia. And the second uh, question is, is related is really, and a more fundamental question really, is whether these changes would uh, enhance uh, the integrity of the electoral system uh, as it stated as one of the purposes uh, of the bill. Now, I think Susie um, uh, really laid the ground very nicely and and importantly, in terms of the first part of the presentation, I think she emphasised certain key terms, which I'll just remind you of because I think they'll be they're quite they'll be pivotal to my analysis of the bill. Um, one is the, about political donations, uh, and all these are I've stressed terms of art. Yes, all right. So as Susie's uh, presentations indicated, a political donation uh, you need to have a gift, but also importantly, the exceptions from the meaning of political donations, even when you have a gift that, uh, that is given without uh, uh, adequate or, or any consideration. Yeah? And another term I would uh, stress and I'll come back to is the concept of political expenditure. And I've just extracted on that particular slide the, the full definition of that, um, uh, that particular term. So when we think about the meaning of political donation under the Victorian Bill, I think it's usefully compared with the other Australian state, that, uh, the, the, uh, the only Australian state that currently imposes caps on political donations, and that is New South Wales. And in New South Wales, this Election Funding Expenditure and Disclosures Act uh, de defines political donation in a way that extends pretty much to any gift made to a registered party, an elected member or a candidate. It also captures gifts made to third, what it considers third party campaigners who might make political donations or incur electoral expenditure. When you compare the approach taken in South Wales with the Victorian Bill, what you see is how the Victorian Bill is actually narrower in a number of respects. First, the Victorian Bill excludes gifts between registered parties and their nominated entities, a point that um, uh, uh, Susie pointed out in her presentation. Now, what are nominated entities? And this is really a new concept introduced in terms of Australian political finance law. And this is openly acknowledged by the, in the secondary speech. Registered parties uh, cannot appoint as their nominated entity any party-controlled incorporated body that operates for the sole benefit of the members of the party and also does not have voting rights in the party. In his secondary speech to the bill, the Attorney General explained that a nominated entity is a new class of entity introduced to address the operational and organisational structures that may exist for registered political parties in Victoria. These statements are somewhat coy. The intent seems to be to exempt from the categories of gifts transfers between the investment and fundraising vehicles of the Victorian branches of the Labour Party and the Liberal Party, including the Victorian ALP's Progressive Business and the Victorian Liberal Party's Comic Foundation. 
Now, also exempted from the definition of gift and therefore from the definition of political donations and therefore from caps and disclosure obligations are annual affiliation fees. Now, the obvious and unstated reason for this provision is to exempt trade union affiliation fees, which Labour receives, and to exempt them from the caps. Now, there are certainly compelling reasons for not treating these affiliation fees in the same way as any other political contributions. And indeed, I've argued very uh, strongly uh, for this differential treatment. But the Victorian Bill goes too far by placing no limits on these affiliation fees. So, by contrast, the New South Wales legislation treats these fees as gifts, which are therefore disclosable and also somewhat subject to caps, but exempts them from caps up to certain limits, calculated at $2,000 for each member of the affiliated organisation. Now, as Susie pointed out, under the Victorian Bill, political donations to associated entities and third party campaigners only occur when a gift is used or intended to be used to enable these entities to make a political donation or incur political expenditure or to reimburse them for these expenses. In other words, what you see in terms of the impact of the bill, the meaning of political donations in relation to associated entities and third party campaigners, the meaning of political donations intertwine with the meaning of political expenditure. And here, the bill proposes the narrowest definition of political expenditure found in any Australian political finance law. So what you have in that, oh no, you don't in this slide, it was in the previous slide, but I'll read it out to you what's in the previous slide. Under the bill, political expenditure means any expenditure for the dominant purpose of directing how a person should vote at election by promoting or opposing the election of any candidate at election or registered political party which has endorsed any candidate at election. Now you can compare that with the much broader definition you find under the New South Wales Act, which is replicated uh, up on that slide. Now, what are some of the practical consequences of this difference in terms of scope? Now, what it will mean is that as the Victorian government has acknowledged, political expenditure will not include what the Americans might call issue advocacy. Yeah? Uh, so, will not include, in the words of the uh, government, advertising and raising awareness about issues without promoting or opposing a candidate or political party. This will exempt most spending on non-party campaigns, opposition to a new freeway, for example. It will also exempt, this particular definition will exempt spending that doesn't involve directing how a person should vote an election. So when you think about directing, you think about words, for example, vote for or don't vote for or oppose and so on and so forth. It will also exclude spending that doesn't involve direct communication with the voters. Yeah? So when you think about the definition, it involves directing the voters, so it involves some communicative element. So we're therefore not in, this definition will not include campaign research or payments for staff to organize party activists. And even when parties or, or organizations communicate directly with voters, they will not be making political expenditure if they do not try to direct the voting decisions of the citizens. Now consider, for example, ads that you might remember from the last state election. So Labour, um, ad about putting people first, yes? Or for the Liberals, who's going to pay, yeah? If you go back and just have to Google these titles and look at those ads, neither of them directed a voter as to how they should vote, yeah? Neither of them use words such as vote for or vote against. So if you had contributions made to trade unions and industry associations to run similar ads, yeah, which did not direct a voter, it's unlikely that those contributions will be considered political donations because spending of those ads are not political expenditure as defined under the bill. Now, when you think about these definitions, then you think about the claim made about being the strictest uh, uh, political finance laws in the country, and we turn our mind to the caps. And what I'll do is actually I'll work through the various measures that we see in the bill. What you see, of course, and perhaps this is what the, the sort of headline the, the government's relying upon, is that the level set by the bill is actually lowest in the country. Yes? 4000 per electoral <coughs> cycle works out about $1,000 per, uh, per annum. But once you go beyond 
that headline feature, if you like. And what then you see is that if we look at the, de the problematic definition of political donations, what you then see is that while the Victorian caps might be stricter in terms of level, they apply to a narrower range of contributions due to the definition of political donations. And further reducing the scope of the caps is the exclusion, of cap, uh, is the exclusion from the caps of self-financing by candidates of their own election campaigns. And further, given the narrow definition of political expenditure, the Victorian Bill also covers a smaller range of what the New South Wales Act considers third-party campaigners. Now, under the bill, a political expenditure exceeding $2,000 in a financial year is necessary before an entity or, per, uh, or person becomes a third-party campaigner. Now, given the narrow definition, dominant purpose of directing uh, a voter uh, uh, in terms of promoting uh, or opposing a, a party or a candidate, I put up a question up in a slide. How many third party campaigners would there be under this particular bill? If your uh, organization just runs on issue advocacy, you might not even reach this $2,000 threshold because you're not directing a voter as to how they should vote. And what we have in terms of the, the exemptions in relation to nominate entities and annual repilation fees is that they will limit the application of caps to all rest of political parties but especially in relation to the Labour Party and the Liberal Party. And it'll be interesting here in terms of see in terms of the exemption in terms of annual affiliation fees, uh, to see whether what is currently given as political donations, the extent to which perhaps some of that might be repackaged as annual affiliation fees after the bill is enacted. Let me move on to disclosures. Now the Victorian bill tightens the requirement for annual returns by parties and seeks to introduce what it calls real-time disclosure of donations. So the annual returns that Susie has talked about, they're a vast improvement on the current obligations, yeah? Which essentially pick up on the Commonwealth scheme and its much criticized cutoff point of $13,200 uh, in terms of itemization of sums. Now vast improvement these measures might be these uh, amendments to annual returns hardly merit being characterized as the strictest disclosure obligations in the country. Queensland, for example, requires biannual returns with details of amounts of 1,000 or more to be provided. And also undercutting the claim that uh, this claim of being the strictest disclosure obligations is a circumscription of the annual returns obligations for associate entities, third party campaigners, and nominated entities and as Susie pointed this out in the presentation, largely to funds relating to their state campaign accounts. The claim that the Victorian Bill creates the most transparent political do donation laws in Australia, to, use, uh, to, uh, to invoke the words of Premier, rests upon the second limb of the new disclosure obligations. And that second limb, according to the Special Minister of State, uh, Gavin Jennings, his claim is that, to quote, for the first time, Victorians will be able to see political donations being disclosed in real time. But if real time means instantaneous, then of course the bill does nothing of this sort. Yes? Yeah? So as Susie pointed out in the presentation, um, uh, those under the obligations to disclose to the Victorian Electoral Commission uh, by 21 days after receipt of the particular donation, and then the VEC is then obliged to publish its uh, details within seven days. So this means, just by simple arithmetic, that details of donations may not be revealed uh, until 28 days after they're received. While these obligations don't result in quite real-time disclosure, they are, admittedly, the most timely of all general disclosure obligations of all Australian jurisdictions. At the same time, they're not as timely or as, as frequent as a regime that applies to large donations in Queensland, where donations of $100,000 or more in a six-month period to registered party, political parties, and so associated entities must be disclosed to the Queensland Electoral Commission within seven working days. Now, there is a, there's a deeper difficulty with these so-called real-time disclosure obligations. Unlike the obligations that apply to annual returns, 
these obligations only apply to political donations. Then here again, the, the problematic uh, definition of political donations rears its head. It will mean that the following need not be disclosed. Gifts between registered political parties and their nominated entities, gifts to associated entities and third party campaigners to spend on issue advocacy, uh, gifts to these organizations to spend on promoting or opposing a candidate party, but nevertheless does not direct a voter as to how they should vote. Let me come to the uh, uh, ban, uh, so-called ban on foreign uh, donors. So Susie has um, um, uh, outlined the key elements of that particular ban, which I will not canvas. If this bill is enacted, it will bring to three the number of states banning uh, so-called foreign political contributions. And this bill is, in fact, the broadest in terms of who is considered foreign. In New South Wales, for example, it is those who don't have an Australian residential address who are considered foreign. In Queensland, the other jurisdiction which has su such a ban, it is the gift of, to quote, foreign property to registered political parties and candidates that is prohibited. In essence, funds uh, being sourced from outside the geographical territory of Australia. But once again, the limited meaning of political donations as it applies to associated entities and third party campaigners calls into question the claim that the Victorian ban is the strictest in the country. Unlike the New South Wales and Queensland bans, gifts to associated entities and third party campaigners to spend on advocating on an issue or promoting or opposing a, a candidate party without directing voters will not be covered. Now, equally important to the caps, the disclosure changes, the disclosure obligations, and the uh, uh, so-called ban of foreign political donations are the increases in public funding that Susie has, has, has mentioned. These measures, mentioned uh, sotto voce by the government, will significantly increase public funding of political parties, especially parties with parliamentary representation at a combined cost of 45 million over four years. Now, how do they compare in terms of the other jurisdictions? Now, as Susie pointed out, there are two sets of changes. The first is to the existing scheme of public funding for election expenditure. Those increases in the level of funding will make Victoria the second most, juris most generous jurisdiction after the Australian Capital Territory. Victoria, however, will be unique in differentiating between votes cast for the lower and upper houses, clearly disadvantaging the minor parties that focus their energies on the Legislative Council. The bill compares even more unfavorably with South Australia, which seeks to offset some of the advantages of the established parties by giving more generous public funding for the first 10% of first preference votes. What about the uh, proposed administrative expenditure funding? This too will make Victoria the second most generous of the five jurisdictions offering such funding, this time behind New South Wales. Like New South Wales, South Australia and uh, the, uh, the Australian Capital Territory, Victoria calculates the amount according to the number of parliamentarians. Now this too will tend to favour the established parties, a fact that the New South Wales legislation recognises with offsetting measures such as the declining rate of entitlement for the number of parliamentarians and a separate pool of money, the Policy Development Fund, for parties without parliamentary representation. Let me come to the final section of my talk, which is really dealing with the second question I posed at the, at the start. And the question being whether these measures would enhance or detract from the integrity of Victorian elections. Now, when you apply this idea of electoral integrity to political funding, it's really a multifaceted concept, which I, I argue rests upon four principles. Four principles you have uh, uh, enumerated on the slide. Protecting the integrity of representative government, particularly through the prevention of corruption and undue influence. Pro promoting fairness in politics, especially in elections. Respecting political freedoms and supporting political parties to discharge their democratic functions. 
This matrix of principles enables us to draw up a fuller assessment of the bill. The restrictions it places on political donations, the caps and disclosure and the ban, clearly place a limit on political freedoms. But given their levels and the, the uh, exemptions, quite significant exemptions, it is difficult to characterize the restrictions as disproportionate to the goal of preventing corruption and undue influence. And the proposed disclosure obligations, while not quite real-time disclosure, will bring about definite improvements in terms of transparency. And the proposed compliance measures that Susie canvassed to at the latter part of the presentation uh, will also strengthen the incentive for political actors to play within the rules. But sizable gaps in the restrictions in terms of political donations undermine the Premier's claim that the new laws will, in his words, eliminate large political donations, and again, in his words, give Victorians confidence that governments are making decisions on their merits, not repaying favours to big political donors. Besides the provisions I've already canvassed, there are three other provisions of the bill that further undermine these claims. First, political donations paid into an account kept exclusively for the purposes of a Commonwealth election campaign are exempted from the caps of the bills, if, though not from disclosure obligations. This will mean that large, in fact unlimited amounts, can be given to Victorian parties so long as they're paid into such an account. Now, there are legitimate constitutional reasons for this exemption. Nevertheless, creative ways could have been devised to address the problems with political fundraising by Victorian parties for Commonwealth electoral campaigns. For instance, to throw up an idea, agreement could have sought, been sought among parties in Victorian Parliament to replicate the measures of the bill as they apply to funds for Commonwealth electoral campaigns. And in fact, have the agreements in such a way that actually allows for a policing body, perhaps a Victorian Electoral Commission. As this agreement, really by way of a form of contract, is not city legislation, it would not be at risk of being struck down. Some of the bill's compliance provisions also undermine the government's claims about its significance. The new powers for the commission that Susie canvassed are welcome, as are the penalties for contravening the caps, including deduction from public funding payments of twice the amount made in contravention. But the weak prohibition of anonymous donations threatens compliance. There are good reasons for allowing anonymous donations of small amounts, say around $50, yeah? So there's always this thing about the chook raffle or the, the, the basket going around and how owners will be in terms of recording details. Fine. But prohibiting only anonymous donations of $1,000 or more sets too low a bar. Details of donations of hundreds of dollars will not need to be recorded. And this may result in the absence of the paper trail necessary for enforcing the caps on political donations. Compliance could also be compromised by the provisions relating to state campaign accounts. Although these accounts are supposed to be the main portal for receiving and spending election campaign funds, the bill clearly fails to effect this purpose. This purpose, I think, Susie was talking about quarantining the funds. Funds that are not political donations, so annual affiliation fees, do not have to be paid in accounts, and spending that is not political expenditure need not be incurred through these accounts. So political parties could comply with legislation and yet still set up separate accounts for state campaign funding on items that are not political expenditure ads that don't direct voters, campaign research, payment for organizers. In fact, the bill not only fails to live up to the government's rhetoric, it also detracts from the integrity of Victorian elections. Political freedoms will be unduly restricted by the ban on foreign political donations. This ban, which applies regardless of the amounts given, will place onerous burdens on regulated organizations, especially less well-resourced groups. Worse, it wrongly limits political participation through contributions by residents of Australia, such as people on temporary visas, and it favours foreign entities that can acquire an Australian business number, who do not need to demonstrate that, that their principal activities are in Victoria. And all this for what? Low caps 
renders such a ban largely unnecessary. More fundamentally, consider the two donors really at the center of the controversy over foreign political donations, Chao Chak Wing, Huang Xiang Mo. Neither of them will be banned by the bill from making political donations. Chao has been an Australian citizen for decades, Huang is a permanent resident. And even if they weren't, they did not have that status, the businesses owned by these donors would probably fall outside the restrictions because they would have relevant business number. Numbers. The most serious vice of the bill is the increased unfairness that will result from an un even more unequal flow of public and private funds. Both the administrative expenditure payments and the public funding payments for electoral expenditure will advantage the established parties. The caps on political donations will further tilt the electoral contest in favour of Labour and the Liberal Party through exemptions relating to nominated entities and trade union affiliation fees. And I should point out, the unfairness of the bill is as much a result of omission as with commission. Singularly absent are limits on election campaign spending, which are essential for a level playing field in electoral contests and already exists in New South Wales, South Australia, and the ACT. As the Canadian Supreme Court has said of the Canadian spending limits, these provisions seek to create a level playing field for those who wish to engage in electoral discourse. This in turn enables voters to be better informed. No one voice is overwhelmed by another. These limits on spending would have also reduced the pressure for fundraising by reducing the demand for electioneering funds. As the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe recommended, states should impose limits on maximum expenditure permitted during election campaigns. Given that, in the absence of upper threshold expenditure, there are no limits to the escalation of costs, which is an incentive for parties to intensify their search for funds. The absence of limits on election campaign spending in the Victorian legislation risks placing pressure on the caps as parties and candidates seek to meet unabated demand for campaign funds. If, on the other hand, the bill had provided for limits on spending, they may have curbed the impact of the uneven flow of private and public funds that will result from its enactment. The spending limits could have acted as a barrier to unequal income translating into unequal spending. As with any law, we must, of course, be wary of perfection being the enemy of the good. In this case, however, the ledger nevertheless tilts towards the shortcomings and the vices of the bill. In my view, the government should go back to the drawing board and have another try at creating, in the words of the Attorney General, a robust political donations and disclosure scheme that we can be proud of.